Triple A is our new sermon series. I was working on Friday, and I had to go get some materials at Menards and Terre Haute, and my helper was with me, and Long John Silver's over by Menards, and we don't have a Long John Silver's, and I was craving fried fish. And so, you know, fried fish, if you pour vinegar on it, it becomes a health food. <laughs> So I gave in, and we went, and after we got uh, done eating, I went out to my 1995 three-quarter ton truck and tried to start it, and it was dead. Lifted the hood, and the terminal was corroded. We proceeded to kind of move it around, and it disintegrated. Thought about calling AAA, but AAA, sometimes their response isn't that quick. I don't even know if they handle battery terminals or not. So we decided to hike, and of course, the closest place was Harbor Freight. And guess what? Harbor Freight didn't have what we needed. So then we hiked to Menards. And so we went to the Menards, and we hiked back. And it was a little frustrating, a little aggravating. It wasn't on the schedule. It wasn't like I expected it to be. But do you ever have those moments where you're frustrated and a little angry and you say to yourself, do I really need this today? Have those moments? I think we all, we all do. And I don't know about you, but today's Super Bowl Sunday. Somebody noticed I was wearing red for the Kansas City Chiefs, so they were already polarizing me into the event. I sort of liked what somebody said on Facebook yesterday. I saw a post that said, you know, what annoys me, what I hate about the Super Bowl is going to be every time that Travis Kelsey makes a catch, they're going to go to Taylor Swift, who's watching it. Said so Taylor Swift, that maybe that makes you mad, maybe it doesn't, maybe maybe you just are annoyed by that, but but Taylor Swift's participation by being a fan of Travis Kelsey in the Super Bowl is supposed to add about three hundred forty million dollars to the whole Super Bowl experience. Can you believe that? So I don't know if you're for the Kansas City Chiefs or for that other team, the Yeah, San Fran. Is it? Are they? Forty Nine ers still in San Francisco? Huh? They still are. Yeah, who knows? Who knows? But there's a game today. I can remember years ago that they said about the Super Bowl that if that the person, if the boyfriend or the husband team wasn't win, winning, there was like an astronomical number of uh, domestic abuse going on during the Super Bowl. Do you remember that? Anybody remember that? That's probably been 20 years ago. That was fictitious, but it kind of gives you an idea. The Kaiser Foundation said this, and just recently, one out of two of us are wrestling with mental and emotional health challenges. So look to your right, look to your left, and if you don't think it's you, then it's right beside you. Marcus Aurelius said it this way. He said, the corruption of the mind is a far more serious pestilence than the one that corrupts the body. He's saying that those mental challenges, those emotional challenges that we have are more debilitating, more threatening to us than even our physical health. And I think we're all feeling it, aren't we? I think from where we've come from to where we are now as a culture over the last two or three years, I think we're better, but people are still angry. I was at a local restaurant. I was eating lunch. A lot of times I carry my iPad with me because I like to read while I'm waiting when I'm eating alone. Don't feel sorry for me. This is quality time, quality experience. I like silence. I like reading and, and, and I like lunch. So it's the best of all worlds. Don't feel convicted. Don't feel like you have to ask Chris to come and eat with you. He's having a good time by himself. And so there was a large crowd and, and a large group had come in. It was taking longer than normal, and I was just reading my iPad and sipping my uh, half-sweet, half-unsweet tea with lemon. That's how I prefer it. And the, the little waitress said, hey, I'm sorry, sir. It, it, it's taking more time than normal. We've got a big group. I said, no problem. I'm having a great day. 
And, and she came back three or four times because she totally expected me to be irritated and angry because of the service. I said, no problems. She said, you wouldn't believe you're an unusual customer in our restaurant. I was at the ER. Did I tell you my ER experience? I didn't tell you this part of the ER experience. I got out, and, and, and the ER experience only lasted like two hours. So I, I was totally prepared for an eight-hour event. I was going to spend the, the night in the ER. I just knew it. I just was. And, and so it was only two hours. I was feeling pretty good. Walked out, and, you know, you have paperwork, and they tell you, and they make a referral. And then they charge you in the ER. And they said, hey, uh, we think it's 120 Oh, no, it's $200, which for some people, that just raises the uncertainty and the angst. I said, no problem. Whatever it is, here's my card. And then they spent the next five to 10 minutes in their system and they could process my card, which I like to pay because if you go into the hospital billing kind of piece or the medical billing kind of piece, sometimes, you know, it, it, you have to know and guess who you pay and then it doesn't go right. And it's just a, another phone call, another half hour on the phone being on hold waiting for a person. You know how that goes. And so they can't process me. They say, sorry, sir. And I said, that's okay. Just bill me and we'll figure it out. And they just stopped in that and said, boy, I wish everybody was like you. I'm thinking, what's the big deal? This is just, some people are mad because they didn't realize they had to pay for the emergency room experience. I'm, I'm looking at them, you know, thinking, what world are you living in? This is, you know, I got in under... Eight hours, I got out, I, so what? We're, we're moving on. My rides, I've got to wait on my ride anyway. They're coming to get me. Thank goodness. Somebody's coming to get me. So that's our culture today. If you wait in a line, if, if it's not immediate, if you have to wait on hold, everybody's angry. According to the U.S. Census Bureau's Household Pulse Survey, Pulse survey, about a third of the adults overall reported anxiety and depression symptoms in 2023. That's just recent. Nearly half of these adults, 49.9%, were in the age group of 18 to 24. 38% were between the ages of 25 to 49, and 29.3% were between 50 and 64, and 20% were 65 plus. This is anxiety and depression. This this is a group of uncertainty and angry below the surface. And 84% of people think Americans are angrier than a generation before. And 42% admit that they themselves are angrier. So that's, does that include you? Does that include me? And I just want to say, that the church needs to be and hopefully is a place to talk about some of these mental and emotional health challenges. If not here, then where? And my whole goal for preaching to you is to be hopeful, to give you hope, and to be helpful. We're here. It's not like the government agency that I'm having a struggle with right now. That, that that when they say, I'm here to help, I want to say, well, how much is it going to cost me and how long is it going to take? No, I don't want to be like that. And truly, we want to be helpful and hopeful. In saying all of this, today we're going to look at anger, and I just want to clarify what I'm talking about. Anger is a feeling of annoyance, displeasure, or hostility. It's a feeling. I was talking to someone who was struggling with their feelings, and the feelings, your feelings aren't wrong. They just are. It's how we deal with our feelings that is so, so important. So my question is this. How many of us have expressed displeasure or hostility towards someone just in the past month? Maybe that's too long. Okay, I got one person raise a hand. How about in the last 24 hours? Okay. 
I have myself. In fact, as I was preaching the first service, someone post. I, I'm 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 dealing with something online, and somebody just posted, told me that I was a scam. That's kind of personal. And so online, I mean online, I mean people don't know each other and they are just dogpiling on top of people they don't even know. They don't even know the background. And, and isn't it amazing that people will be, they will do things and say things in text, online, in email that they would never say in person? It's just crazy. And then we ask, well, is anger bad? Because why am I so angry? No, it's just how we deal with it. And we need to be very careful with how we express our anger. Christian, you can, it's okay to be angry. It's not a sin to be angry. We've got to recognize this. Anger is a very real emotion. It's okay. In fact, gentlemen, most of our uh, emotion is anger because that's our default language most of the time. But it's not an excuse. Recognize that Jesus got angry and he did not sin. He got angry at injustice. Remember, when he cleansed the temple, when he was dealing with the scribes and Pharisees, the ones that should have known better and didn't, those that misapplied the word of God to, for their own agenda rather than to help and to make people hopeful. The Apostle Paul, who was an angry individual, uh, a type A individual who persecuted and murdered Christians before he had a change of life and heart, he writes this in Ephesians to the church at Ephesus. He says, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. So you can be angry and not sin. There is a way to be angry and not sin. I like this kind of comparison. So anger can be like a trouble light in your car that you need to check under the hood. When your engine light goes off in your car, do you just keep on driving for home? Or do you pull along the, the side of the road and you call AAA? and get it fixed before you blow an engine. I think as a youth pastor in this church, in the life of this church, I have won the award of blowing the most engines. The first bus trip I took out, we were going to a Bill Gothard seminar in, in the, Indianapolis. And of course, I was the only one that had a, uh, well, it wasn't a CDL, it was a public pastor, chauffeur's license. And the first time out, First trip, new, young youth pastor. I was young at one time, by the way. Drove to Indianapolis. We got about halfway, and guess what? Blew an engine. I've blown engines in Wagon Wheel, New Mexico. I've blown engines in uh, Lexington, Kentucky. I I think, I forget where else I've blown. I've blown engines out east, on the east coast, uh, everywhere. Anyway, so... That trouble light, if it goes off, is to alert me that there is some heart and mind work that needs to occur in my life, and we need to listen to it. When that anger button is pressed, that trouble light in my soul, in my spirit, it means that I need to look under the hood and say, what's going on? We've all gone off, I think, before like that, and you think, what in the world has just occurred? And it doesn't have anything to do with that incident. It has to do with everything else. There are two reactions to anger. One is to stuff it, and it builds up. You just put it away, and you you say, I'm not going to deal with that. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to say anything until you spew it. And it blows up like this volcano, and it goes all over, and in an extreme circumstance. Now, we're going to get to the biblical portion of the of the message right here. I don't know if you've been reading through the Bible in the year, but I'm in the book of Exodus right now. And I've just read this in my daily Bible reading. I think it's appropriate. If you turn in your Bibles, your tablets, if you're joining us online, grab, grab whatever you've got, or you can watch on the screen, Exodus chapter 17, verses 1 and 2. 
This is the children of Israel. They've been delivered out of Egypt. They've been on the road for a few or in the wilderness for, for, for a little while now. And here's what Moses writes. He says, all the congregation of the people of Israel moved on from the wilderness of sin by stages, according to the commandment of the Lord and camped at Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. Now, this is a serious problem. They had no Aquafina. They didn't have Brazil city water. They didn't have Terre Haute city water, wherever you're from. They didn't have a well because they were traveling. There's no water. Pretty important when you're in the wilderness to have water. There was no Coke or Pepsi trucks to feed these people. There were probably about over 2 million. There were 600,000, at least 600,000 men. You double that with women. You, you, you may, maybe three to four to a family. You could have 2.4 million people in the wilderness. That's, you need a lot of water, a lot of water. Therefore, the people quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. Moses might have thought, hey, do I look like I'm a water company? I'm a water provider? No, they they just drug me. God just drug me out of the wilderness into Egypt to deliver you out out of Egypt. I'm just your leader. But Moses said to them, and here's what he says, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? Haven't you seen what he's done? Is what he's saying. And in verse 3, he said, But the people thirsted there for water, and, and the people grumbled against Moses and said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt? Are you trying to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? Now, I have the gift of sarcasm. It's not a spiritual gift. And it doesn't preach very well. But I am thinking to myself as I read this, I want to say, if I were Moses, yes, I did. It it is the greatest plot of all history. I have brought you out of Egypt. You've suffered 10 plagues. You have a pillar of cloud by day. You got a fire by night. You, 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 I parted the Red Sea just by my own strength and power. Obviously, I want to kill you in the wilderness. That's what I want to say. But Moses doesn't. And I want you to see what is going on here in this moment of history. There is negativity. There is gloom and doom. There is worst case scenario. Are you here to kill us and bury our children in the wilderness? There's conspiracy theory, which is saying, I know, Moses, that you're doing this. You're in it for the money. Yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? It's ridiculous. But how does Moses respond to all of this? How does he respond? So Moses cries out to the Lord. I think that's a pretty good response. I would say, are you kidding me? This is ridiculous. But Moses cries to the Lord. You see, Moses shifted his focus He sees a purpose beyond what is present in the moment. And look at what what he says. What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. I think he's got a serious rebellion going on. And then the Lord said to Moses, pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel and taking your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. So, So God is saying, stop reflecting the anger. Don't get involved in this exchange of anger and be a leader. Set the example. We might understand this way. We may not do this well. Be the non-anxious presence in the anxious moment. When everything else is going off, take a breath. Don't be anxious, but be non-anxious and trust in God. In verse 6 of this passage, here's what God says. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and the water shall come out of it, and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. Now think about this. I got 2.3 or 4 million people all happy Jews, 
And the, no negativity. I'm making. I'm being sarcastic now. Obviously, they're not happy. And and God, you're going to take me to a rock to get water. Are you missing the point here? Take me to a river where it won't run dry. Take me to a pond. Take me to a lake. Take me to a well that we can get water. But God is taking me to a rock. What do you think Moses is thinking? And I just want you to know that this is God flexing and saying, I am who I am. What was Moses thinking? God, do you really know what you're doing in this moment? I'm doing what you told me. But but water out of a rock? Really? It's not making sense. And he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah because of the quarreling of the people of Israel. God could bring water from anywhere, is what he was showing. And because they tested the Lord by saying, is the Lord among us or not? Have you ever been in that moment where you've asked that question, hey, God, are you with me? Maybe you're going through the dark night of the soul. Maybe life isn't going as you're expected. Maybe you're being falsely accused and attacked. Maybe you're fighting with an entity or an organization for what you think is right, and it's not going well. And you're saying, Lord, are you with me? Are you there? Are you seeing this? And then you ask, how am I supposed to respond to this without having sinful anger and getting even and retaliating? And maybe your goal is like for me, I want to process my anger in such a way that it doesn't cause damage to myself, my relationships, or my connection to God. And sometimes it's a challenge, sometimes it's hard. In Psalm 139, it says, O Lord, you have searched me and you know me. And and what he's saying is, examine my heart. Examine what's going on underneath the hood when that red warning light comes on. Examine my heart when I have that anger. Where is that coming from? Cornell University says that most successful CEOs have great self-awareness. And the question is, are we self-aware in that moment when that red light goes on? And do we know what really is going under the hood? Are we willing to investigate and own the responsibility of maybe this is not the event that is causing this irrational anger or this uh, multiplied anger and over-the-top response? And and when I say that about the CEOs, this self-awareness is defined is a conscious knowledge of one's own character, feelings, motives, and desires. What is really going on? Self-awareness is knowing what it's like to be on the other side of you. It's really realizing how people are responding to you and why, because of what you're doing. And we've got to realize that the children of Israel were in a tough spot. They were out on a hike that was going to last for an indefinite amount of time. It was uncertain. They had physical and emotional needs. They were moving from place to place. They didn't know where their next stop was going to be. So they were unhappy. They they didn't naturally trust God, even though they had seen God work over and over again. And and isn't that like us? Don't we do that as well? We, we've seen God. We've experienced his blessing. We've seen his hand work in our lives. And they were making demands and arguing. They were cynical. There were conspiracy theories. There were doom and gloom. There were worst case scenarios. And yet God was faithful. Does that sound familiar to you and your life? Have you ever asked the question, why did you bring us out of Egypt? Are you trying to kill us, our children, and our livestock with thirst? And and this, in other words, in this anger situation, is called an amygdala hijack. 
The amygdala is the front part of your brain, and it reacts. It's a re- reptilian response. It's, it's that immediate rush and the first thing that comes into your mind. It's a personal and emotional response that is immediate, overwhelming, and out of measure to the, the stimulus. It happened just like that. And you might even say in retrospect, how did that happen? Why did I respond that way? I was way, I was like out of my mind. I I don't even know who that was. We see this with the Apostle Peter in the Garden of Gethsemane. It was after the Last Supper that they celebrated with Jesus. It was before Jesus was crucified. They, They were in the garden. They had prayed. And and the high priest soldiers and Roman soldiers had come to take Jesus. Now, you got to understand, Peter's expectations of Jesus was that he was the Messiah. He was going to be king, and, and Peter was going to be one of his henchmen. He was going to be the right-hand guy. He was going to be all of that politically and socially. But that wasn't Jesus' agenda. Because Jesus had told them repeatedly, and even before this experience, that he was going to lay down his life for our sin for them as well. And so Jesus had them carry a couple swords. I've always wondered about this. And so what was Peter's amygdala response, emotional response in that moment when they came to arrest him? He slices off Malchus's ear with that sword. What was Jesus's response? Can you imagine? He picks up this bloody ear, I assume off the ground, and he picks it up and he places it back on Malchus's ear where his ear was. And like a Lego, it clicks back together and he heals them. Isn't that amazing? Jesus was that non-anxious presence in the moment that they were going to take him away, judge him, beat him, and crucify him. So what's the practical application of what I've been speaking about this morning? First of all, when you begin to feel angry, when you have that amygdala hijack, step back, pause, take a breath, and ask God, to examine your heart. When you see that and feel that red light going off, that warning light, stop. Don't drop a comment, but have a conversation. There have been times in my life that I've waited 24 hours. There have been times in my life where I've waited a week. And, and, and there are times where I've just had to check myself because it wasn't redemptive, it wasn't God-honoring, it wasn't the right response. And there have been other times, I want to tell you, that I've blown it royally to the moment and and engaged in that amygdala response. I can tell you, 100% of the time, I have failed and I have been wrong. I haven't honored God. The proverb writer writes it this way in verse 14 or chapter 14, verse 29. He says, people with understanding control their anger and a hot temper shows great foolishness. Another practical application is to choose to respond rather than to react. To take that breath and think about it. A gentle answer deflects anger, but harsh words make tempers flare. I've told you before, I've had moments where some of the best Christian mothers and women that I've known have cussed me out as a youth pastor. I've told you that moment. And and it always disengages them because you will just like hunker down and you will bear the storm and the brunt and you'll let them vent and just go off. And then when you respond quietly and gently, not in kind, it totally disengages them. Just a quiet answer. I know that's how you feel, but that is not the truth. If you want to know the truth, come and talk to me. And just walk away. There are moments where you're going to be mistreated. Absolutely. 
Don't respond in kind. Don't escalate the experience. De-escalate and respond kindly, especially when you know it's not true. Another practical application, refuse to stereotype people from a distance. When we don't know the circumstance, we don't know the person, get up close and personal. You don't know the circumstance. You don't know what kind of day they've had or what kind of life they've had. Be merciful. Have grace. Understand. Here's Peter who had the amygdala response, the hijack in the Garden of Gethsemane. Here he writes later in life, he says this, Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. I wonder if he's thinking about that time that he sliced Malchus's ear off. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless, for to this you were called that you may obtain a blessing. That's old Peter from experience. Also, listen with an open mind rather than speaking your mind. Listen, 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 and be curious. James, the brother of Jesus, he wrote it this way. He said, know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Be angry, don't sin. Listen, listen, listen. Don't respond in kind. You know, when I think about the Lord in relationship to us and to relationship to me in specifics, I think I'm glad that we have a God that is merciful and gracious, that is slow to be angry with me, and he abounds in steadfast love, that you and I are loved by a holy God. He says in Psalm 103, he says, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Know that you're loved. Know that you've received God's mercy. Know that you are forgiven, that he is present and he's doing a work in your life. And it may be frustrating. You may have anger and that's okay, but deal with your anger in a positive way, that you can honor God, that you could keep your relationships, that you can reflect the love of Christ. Will you stand with me as I pray? Eternal God and Father, we are grateful for this day. And Father, you know, we live this life uh, as aliens and sojourners, or not sojourners, but we are just passing through on this planet. And Father, there are challenges, there are conflicts, there are frustrating things that go on in all of our lives. And Father, we just pray that we might reflect you, reflect Christ. Father, that it's okay for us to be angry, but help us to deal with it, to process it, to to grow in maturity that we may become more like you. And Father, we just ask for those that, that need to come to know you as Lord and Savior, that they need to repent and to be changed by you in that transforming work. We pray that you would just do that in the name of Jesus. Father, for those that are far from you, or even questioning that you even exist, we pray that you plant that seed of faith in them, that it might grow to to them coming to know you as Lord and Savior, your Son as Lord and Savior of their life, that they might obey in baptism, that they might grow and become a disciple, that others might know you. Father, we just ask your work to be done in all of our lives through your spirit and by your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Will you come this morning?